Our dear viewers and listeners, we greet you all in the wonderful and precious name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. This is the day the Lord has made. And we shall rejoice and be glad in it. Welcome to today's Bible study. And as we open up, I invite you to invite somebody to join us. And let's dedicate this moment to God in prayer. Let's pray. Precious Lord, we thank you yes, for your grace, for your word that has life, power, wisdom, and grace. Yes, we receive it. Mm. Let it work in us. Yes, Reveal Jesus mm. to the praise and the glory of your name. Amen. Amen. We will be taking today's reading from the book of Romans, chapter 1, and verse 18. The Bible reads, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. What we have here is a sobering announcement of the divine wrath of God. And this contrasts against what we have just seen coming up to this point. Paul has been giving us the good news. And suddenly we see a turnaround to see what is not so good news, but necessary for us in our work of salvation. We, from this point forward, until we get to chapter 3 and verse 20, the theme that runs through the message is condemnation. Musango. Why condemnation? Because it goes back to emphasize what we stated earlier. The need for humanity to be saved. Man's greatest need is not a new car. Man's greatest need is not a new pair of clothes. Man's greatest need is not a new house. Yes, all those may be things that you require to make life easier. Your greatest need is not a new phone. The greatest need for humanity is the need to be forgiven. Why? Because all of us have sinned and we have fallen short of the glory of God. Last week we saw the meaning of righteousness and we picked it from the Greek word dikaiosune which means equity with God. Omitting the standard of God. And that is where all humans fall short. And we require the righteousness of God which is found through faith in Jesus Christ in order for us to meet with God's standard. So, short of meeting that standard, you become a candidate of what we are seeing here. 
You are faced with the wrath of God. Because you have not made God's standard. And the Bible says for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Paul is making an argument here. The reason why we need the gospel. And he does not sugarcoat it. He places it quite very clear. He doesn't say you need the gospel because you are living an unsuccessful life. Whereas, yes, I agree, an unsuccessful life could be a pointer that you need the gospel. But he doesn't say that you need the gospel because your life is not successful. He doesn't reveal your need for the gospel. Because you are lonely. He doesn't say you need the gospel. Because here, after that, you will find a good spouse. He doesn't say you need the gospel to address your insecurities. Whereas the gospel may meet those. But that is not the necessity of the gospel. It states that you need the gospel because you are under the wrath of God. And you are are headed to hell. Eternal destruction. Now when we talk about the wrath of God, true good words come to the fore. And both of them are used in the New Testament. The first one is the word kumo. Now kumo means that wrath of God the intense feeling that flares up suddenly. And we see this in the book of Revelation. Then there is the other word, Oge. Now, Oge again talks about wrath, but the wrath that builds up over time. So it is a wrath that is appearing at this time. It appears in time and it appears in eternity. And that is what we are looking at right now. So why is the divine wrath of God a part and attribute of his. Because it is a necessary part of his holiness. Because if there is no wrath, then there can be no holiness. You see, for all the evil, all the unrighteousness that goes on, often in life we sit back and think that God is a bystander in all this. But when we read the scriptures, we see that this is not so. Here Paul is going to address the wrath of God. The one that happens in two folds. One which the Bible tells us will happen in the future. 
Like we see in Romans chapter 2 and verse 5. Where the Bible tells us that because of your stubbornness, Paul is writing an unrepentant heart. You are storing up for yourself wrath. In the day of wrath. And the revelation of the righteous judgment of God. What he's trying to say is that every sin an unbeliever commits now. You are storing up an increasing measure of wrath from God. So the more you sin, the more you pile up the wrath about God. So the greater the sins, the greater will be the wrath of God on that day. So for every unrepentant sinner today, and believe in Christ Jesus. I would borrow the hand, the words of Jonathan Edwards. You are in the hands of an angry God. Because all unconverted souls will be swept away into the bowels of hell and will be submerged in the depth of God's divine wrath. I would compare it to a dam. There is a wall that is constructed and it is that wall that holds back the water. When the wall breaks down or when the wall is brought down, what you are faced with is the fury of the rushing water. And that is how tsunamis happen. Basically, what is happening is the wall that is shielding you and I that have sinned and refused to repent is the mercy of God. But that mercy will not hold for all eternity. When the mercy of God is withdrawn, at that moment, what you will be left with is the wrath of God that comes upon you for all eternity. And that's what the Bible is talking about. That the wrath of God is revealed. That is the word apocalypto. We talked about it. It is the unveiling. Now Paul is using a present continuous tense. So it is not the wrath that is going to be revealed on the last day. That we saw in Romans 25. It says it is revealed. Basically in this present time. The wrath of God is revealed. And how is that wrath revealed? Let me explain. The present wrath of God is what I would call the abandonment wrath. This is where men reject God. They reject everything he represents. And when you do that, you come to a place in your life where he abandons you and turns you over to your ways. Now he has turned you over to his wrath. 
Basically, what happens? This is what the Bible announces. In Romans chapter 1, verse 24, 26 to 28. In 24, this is what it says. He says, therefore, this is what it says. He says, therefore, God gave them over in their lusts to the lusts of their hearts to impurity so that their bodies would be dishonored among them. So he gives them over. So now that the impurity of their lust causes their bodies to be dishonored. In 26, he comes back and says, for this reason, God gave them over to the degrading passions. For their women exchange the natural function for that which is unnatural. And this is the gross act of lesbianism. And he goes on to say that in the same way, men also abandon the natural function of the woman and burn in their desire towards one another. And this is homosexuality. And just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer. So this wrath is God giving them over to their ways. And what we see here is a degradation that goes farther away from God. That goes farther away from his design for humanity. So you go deeper and deeper into an ocean that leads nowhere. And in 28, the Bible says, and Paul is illustrating, what happens when God gives you over? He says, and God gave them over to a depraved mind to do those things which are not proper. So the final phase of abandonment, your mind becomes depraved. You stop thinking rationally. And the Bible tells us that as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. So it becomes like a day plague to you. You reject the authority of scripture. You reject everything that God represents. You reject everything that the Bible states is truth. And often you try to redefine everything the Bible says is what will happen to you. And today when you meet people who say they will not be an eternal condemnation. Those are given over to a reprobate mind. Those that think God cannot be a God of love and be a God of justice at the same time. Those are the people that we are talking about. Because in spite of what the Bible expresses and says, they have, because of their constant desire 
to suppress the knowledge of God. So God gives them over to their sins. They continue making the insane decisions. And whatever decision they take draws them further away from God. So what are the reasons for this divine wrath? Why the divine wrath? Why would God who is loving reveal his wrath. This wrath, the Bible says, is on the ungodliness of men. Of all men. It doesn't say on some ungodliness. It talks about all ungodliness of men. This is the fury that is revealed on all ungodliness. And the Bible says it is revealed from heaven. So what Paul here wants to paint is a strong picture of the fury of God descending down from heaven upon every individual that is ungodly. Now we will explain what ungodliness is all about. Ungodliness is the Greek word asebia. Basically what it means is to be iri, is to be irreverent. So Ungodliness is man's perennial unbelief. Towards God and towards his gospel. So every time the gospel is presented, they will reject it. And this results into rebellion that happens in two fronts. Towards God and also towards man. So it has both a vertical and a horizontal dimension. And the horizontal is where it is revealed in unrighteousness. You say, let me explain it this way. And it begins with ungodliness. When we talk about being irreverent, it goes back to determine everything you think about God. And the most important thing that will ever enter into the mind of a man when they think about God is what will drive their life forward. So what you think about God is the domino effect of everything else that happens to you in life. It determines where you work what you do what you do when you are faced with adversity your personal knowledge of God is what charts your walk in life. It is what determines every step of the way of your life. It impacts the decisions that you make. How you live your life. What your priorities 
What your motives are in life. It determines what your ambitions and dreams in life will be. It determines what happens in time. And what will happen through all eternity. So this Asabia as we know it. Involves a form of idolatry. Involves a form of idolatry. So you have a reverence. But also if you are an idolater. That means you have replaced God with something or someone else. And it also takes a third dimension. And it also takes a third dimension. Where men do not take God seriously. Yes, they know he's there. But they just say, okay, let him be. I, I, will, I will take care of my business. And that is evidenced when men refuse to commit their life to God. And in so doing, fail to live for the glory of God. So where your life is centered on me, myself, and I, and there is nothing that lives for God, you are being ungodly. You are right there in the place where the wrath of God is focused on you. And the Bible goes on to tell us because everyone knows about God. Everyone, they may reject it, they may refuse it. But God is evident to every one of us. Verse 19, verse 20 of chapter 1. Verse 21. And I will pick up verse 21 because it says, For even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God. No giving thanks. But they became futile in their speculation. And, and their foolish heart was darkened. This is the darkened picture of ungodliness. So when we talk about ungodliness, it points up one statement. No fear of God. This is what Paul summarizes in Romans chapter 3 verse 18. When he talks about ungodliness in the broader sense he says there is no fear of God in their eyes. And that is so graphic of what is happening today. And it is what is so sudden is that this is happening even within the walls of the church. Many people are in there and you don't see that revering fear of the Lord. They remove everything about their lives that would bring the fear of God in them. Recall, this is a flawed approach. It is a path that leads to only one destination. It leads to ungodliness. Look at how many pages, I mean, how many books of the Bible. Within the Old Testament. Go to the book of Job. 
tutandikire mu yobo Psalms Zaburi Ecclesiastes Echo Mirembe Proverbs Engedo All these state one thing Ebitabo bino byo na byogera ku kintu kimu The fear of God Obutatya katonda The fear of the Lord Obo okubera nentisa ya katonda Is the beginning of wisdom so it is the beginning of everything that is godly and right. It begins with the fear of the Lord. No, no, no one in Isaiah 11. When they talk about the Holy Spirit, amongst what he comes with in our lives, he comes with the fear of the Lord. When that is absent in our lives, then the Holy Spirit is not present. However much we try and talk about it, we may shiver. Even the devil trembles at the name of Jesus. The fear of the Lord should define us. The fear of the Lord is what draws us. To On the day of Pentecost, when Peter stood up preaching, the Bible says, and the word cut their hearts. Concerning what will happen to them. And they ask, what must we do to be saved? Look at those words. What must we do to be saved? They are running from the wrath of God. Is that what we see today? Is that where the gospel we hear you today is leading us to? You see, in heaven, no, nobody giggles their way to salvation. No, you, we don't come into the kingdom skipping, jumping. No, no you, you realize that where I am now, save for the grace and mercy of God, I am doomed. I am right now under the wrath of God. And it is that then that causes you to have a reverential air of this God. And that is the realization that you without Christ are presently and eternally under God's judgment. And when you are convinced of that, then you know that without Jesus Christ, you are foul, you are wicked. You are depraved. And that is where the issue of life is. So the Bible says that the wrath of God is now revealed on what? On the unrighteousness of men. So you have first the ungodliness. And then he says, and unrighteousness. Now, he's not just trying to state the same thing. Ungodliness ultimately flows into unrighteousness. And last week we talked about the righteousness of God. Which is measuring to the weight of God's standard. So when you come short, then the negative sets in you are unrighteous. The Greek word is the word adikia. Where you come short. When you meet the standard, then that is what we call dikayosun. Basically, when you don't meet the standard, you are on your own. 
So you have your own righteousness. Which in the eyes of God is an unrighteousness. Because without Christ you can't measure up. So without God or without Christ. Whatever you do. Everything you try and attempt in life will never meet that standard. So every step you take as a person, you are living a life that is apart from God's word. Because the good and desirable thing which God desires of all men is that all should be saved. So why? Because if you are not saved from his wrath, then you are under his wrath. And there is nothing you can do under his wrath that is pleasing to him. That is why religion is so dangerous. Because it will tell you that if you did ABC without Christ, you will measure up. I told you last week and I will emphasize that without Jesus Christ we are dead men and dead men do one thing they stink so what you have is a stench before God. Every act is stench before God. So it, it can never be an error. There is nothing you will do that is pleasing to him. So every, the way you conduct yourself is all unlawful before him. It, it is lawlessness before him. Because you have not even met the standard. And you cannot meet it of your own. So a life that you live without God is a life of continuous lawlessness. You are living under the wrath of God. So ungodliness flows into unrighteousness. And everything that happens there is despicable to God. See, and so ungodness and unrighteousness give us both the horizontal and the vertical relationship. And godliness is vertical. And righteousness then flows. It is how then you conduct yourself in relation to others. Praise be to God. And this points to the Ten Commandments that we know. The first four deal with ungodliness. The next six deal with how we relate to other people. So both the vertical and horizontal direction are not made because we have failed at the very first step. We are under God's wrath. And what happens thereafter? The Bible says, Bible yegamba, those who are under, who are unrighteous and ungodly, do this. Basically, this is their job description. This is what they put their effort to every day of their lives. Everything about them is directed to this. 
All their labors, all their efforts are directed at suppressing the truth in righteousness. So everything that tries to bring the righteousness of God is suppressed. And we saw that the righteousness of God is revealed in the gospel of Jesus Christ. So everything that points to the gospel of Jesus Christ which will bring up the truth in righteousness is suppressed. And the word suppress here is a very interesting word that we find in the Greek language. It pictures someone who gets a ball. It is the word kateko which means if you have been playing a game, a ball game on water, or if you get an inflated ball, and you try to submerge it in water, so every time you apply pressure, you try and put it underneath. But as soon as you release your hand, that ball comes up. So that act of trying to submerge the ball is where we get the suppression here. So ungodliness and unrighteousness of men gets the truth of the righteousness of God which is the gospel of Jesus Christ that saves and tries to suppress it and tries to restrain it, to hold it back. So you try to rid yourself of the knowledge of God. You try to hold back the idea of the very existence of God. They try to submerge every accountability to God. So yes, they see the creation which points to a creator. And yet, they come up with every flimsy explanation which does not make sense to justify why they should not be accountable to any being. And this is present with us today. I have encountered so many people that they will try and use anything else, any name other than the name of God. They would rather call him nature. They say Mother Nature has decided. And, and you're like, what is Mother Nature? So they, they are trying to define God's existence. And define his character by something that does not exist. So, this is the fact. Whether you like it or not, the only way to get this truth is to have the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it is this gospel that leads you to the Creator. It is this gospel that unveils who you are. 
Ye kuoko bi kuli woko banya chicho ni why you are here? Ne kuenzo ngarachi ocha limula mukusi. And why you need to get saved? Ne kula garachi weta goko loko ka. So the greater you suppress this knowledge of God, buli bolu ano kuziza ukumanya no kutegera katoa. The greater will be the wrath of God upon that individual. Mungeli yemu no busungo budgeti o munto e muba budzi bwe yongera kuzima. So it doesn't matter where you are. Since ongoliwa. The greatest sin is rejecting the greatest revelation of truth concerning the existence of God as revealed in the person of Jesus Christ and his finished work. When we reject that, we are aspiring down down a bottomless pit of God's judgment. This is what Paul talks about. Paul, what do you get? In the book of Romans, chapter 1, verse 8. Listen to what he says. It says, but to those who are selfishly ambitious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, wrath and indignation await them. So every one of those have this waiting for them. God's wrath and God's indignation. So, when we talk about that, you see, for many people, when we talk about eternal condemnation, we think we are going, you will be going to a place where possibly the devil will be in charge. No. In this place of eternal condemnation, this is not a place where you will self-inflict your, you self-inflict with pain. This is a place where you will self-inflict offense. And the person will say, okay, decide the punishment. And then you decide which punishment you would want. Here it doesn't happen. <laughs> you don't determine what you want. So it is not something you will get, a choice you get to make. So certainly it is not even the devil that is inflicting this wrath. So it is not the devil that is inflicting this wrath. The one inflicting this wrath on the unrepentant sinner and the devil himself and all his subjects is the omnipresent God who oversees everything that is happening everywhere. So it is God who inflicts this wrath on the unrighteous. And it is well deserved. It goes to every extent because God patiently waits on unrighteous people to come to the saving faith. Look at what he says in Romans chapter 9, verse 22. He says, what if God, although willing to demonstrate his wrath and to make his power known and what with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction. God endured it. 
much patience. The vessels of wrath prepared for destruction. So whatever is happening is if you are ungodly if you are unrighteous now and forever except when you come to Christ you are under God's wrath and this is where Paul gives us the rescue and he says for for the wrath of God and basically why is he beginning with the word for he's giving you a reason or to explain what has preceded what is coming here basically he's saying from A to B from C to D I say if you don't now he works backwards and say if this is to be avoided then it has to go back to what is it that we must do so now we are asking the question what is it that you must do to avoid the wrath of God Paul begins to tell us that I am eager to preach the gospel. And he says, why is he eager to preach the gospel? And he says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Why? Because it is the power of God and to salvation. So the only way for you to be saved is to receive the gospel. And in verse 18, it says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness. So the reason why you can be saved from the wrath of God is when you receive the gospel of Christ. Because the gospel of Christ is the power of God to save. To save you from the wrath of God which he has revealed. So everything comes from God. God has given you the avenue to escape his wrath. So when you receive the avenue God has given, then you escape from his wrath. When you reject the avenue God has placed there, then you are left with nothing but the wrath of God facing you. That is why it is important for those that have received this faith to take the news of the gospel to the ends of the world. No wonder Paul writes in Romans 10. He says, blessed are the feet of those who bring good news. Oh, blessed are the feet of those who bring the glad tidings of good news. And it goes on to say, for faith comes by hearing. And hearing by the word of God. So how shall they hear unless somebody tells them? And so it is up to us who have received this gift of salvation to take the good news to all 
that need it. And who is those that need it? All that are ungodly. And all that are unrighteous. Need this gospel. Quite because all of us, when we wish, and when we see that in detail in chapter 3, that all of us, Jews and Greeks, are all under sin. The Bible says in verse 10 and 11, it says there is none righteous. Not even one. What they know, there is none that understands. <laughs> there is none that seeks after God. So all of us come short in this aspect. So everyone, there is no one seeking God. So outside of Christ, you can't be seeking after God. You, you are not running to God. You are running away from Him. And Paul goes on to amplify this and says, all of us have turned aside. And says, together they have become useless. There is no one doing good. <laughs> he says there is not even one, not even one. No more So outside of Jesus Christ, this is where you are. He says their throat is an open grave. He goes on to say, with their tongues they keep deceiving. The poison of asps is in their lips. Whose lips is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are quick to shed blood. Destruction and misery is in their path. The path of peace they have not known. And verse 18, that is where he crowns it and says, There is no fear of God before they arise. What is Paul trying to describe here? Paul is trying to describe somebody who is outside of Jesus Christ. And this is the sobering truth. This is who you are. Now, what happens? That is why salvation is important. Because the salvation of God is what saves you from this situation. Romans 5 and 9 He says much more than having been justified by his blood we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him so salvation is not for rescuing a sinner from a meaningless existence. Salvation is not to deliver you from a bad job. It, it is not to save you from your personal insecurities. It is not from saving you from being unhappy with yourself. It is saving you you from God. And only God can save you from himself. This salvation is obtained or is accomplished through the life and the death of his son Jesus Christ. And is offered to all men to every person of every walk of life at no cost. You come and you receive 
what Christ has done. As a propitiation through his blood. Basically, the word propitiation is an amazing word. It is the word that we find in Romans chapter 3 and verse 25. And when we get to chapter 3, we shall look at it in detail. Basically, what it means is that through the blood of Jesus Christ, the wrath and the anger of God has been appeased. What this means is that the death of Jesus Christ satisfied the wrath of God towards all sinners who believe in him. So God took this wrath upon himself on the cross. So when Jesus bore our sins in his body, he suffered the wrath of God for our sins upon himself. And listen to me. What this means is that there is not a drop of wrath left for those who place their faith in Jesus Christ. So when you place your faith in Jesus Christ, the scripture is now fulfilled. That there is that therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. There is no wrath left because all that wrath was subjected on Christ on the cross of Calvary. God has a rescue plan for all human beings against his wrath. And that plan is in Jesus Christ. So if you have committed your life to Jesus Christ, the biggest issue of your life has been taken care of. So all the others can be taken care of. But if you have not given your life to Jesus Christ, you may be going to church, but the church cannot save you. Yes, you need to go to church after you are saved. But that will not take you to heaven if you are not saved. You are not yet right with God. You are unrighteousness. You are ungodly. And the wrath of God is upon you. And I say that wrath. You see, for many people who think the wrath of God is when people die, no. That wrath is revealed when God gives you over to your sins. But right now, you can be made right with God. You can repent your sins right now. Place your faith in Jesus Christ. And the wrath of God will be placed upon Jesus. And you benefit by receiving the righteousness of God through faith in his person and his finished work. Let's pray. And you make that decision today. It is a personal decision. But it will change your life forever. Say, dear God of heaven, the creator of the universe, the creator of every living and unliving thing. Here I am before you. A sinner. I need to be saved. 
Neta go koloko de boa. I believe that Jesus Christ Zikiriza Yesu Christo is the Savior of the world. Ye muloko ziwensi. And he died Yafa. to bear my sins. O kustasule bibibia. Today I commit my life to Jesus. De robu lambu wange mbukwasa Yesu. Come. Jango. Take your place in my life. Fill me with your spirit. Lead me from this day forward in your path of righteousness for your name's sake. Lord, I thank you for saving me. I thank you for filling me with your Holy Spirit. Help me this day forward to live my life for you, for your glory, for your honor, and for your fame. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 If you made that prayer, brief as it is, you have been wonderfully saved. There is the number on your screen, please call it. Someone will give you the very basic instruction on this new journey. And your life will never, never be the same again. So for those of you watching us that are wonderfully saved, it doesn't matter what you're faced with right now. The greatest crisis of your life is behind you. You are the righteousness of God. And God, all things are possible. The one who began the good work in you, place your faith in him. He will accomplish the glory of his name. From Dominion Church International. We are saying it's been a pleasure having you today. God richly bless you. Until we meet again. Shalom.